Hi everyone, Anthony Morganti here. Last week I did a video on Affinity Photo 2 and I mentioned in that video that if you wanted me to do more videos to let me know and many people commented that they did want to see more videos on Affinity Photo 2. So here's another video on Affinity Photo 2. I'm just going to give you an overview of how you might go about doing an edit in Affinity Photo 2. Now as you open and look at Affinity Photo 2 you'll notice it looks a lot like Photoshop. It is more of a Photoshop clone than it is, say, a Lightroom clone, uh, because um, in Lightroom, there's a digital asset manager. That's the library module. There, you could have all your images organized in folders. You could put them in collections. You could give them star ratings and color labels and things like that. You could edit metadata. Uh, most of that isn't in Affinity Photo 2. Affinity Photo 2 is more like Photoshop, where you would open single in images up into it, and you could do raw edits in Photoshop in Adobe Camera Raw, and you can do raw edits in Affinity Photo 2 as well, except you're doing it in what's called the Develop Persona. That's what they call it. So let's do one. I have Affinity Photo 2 open. On my desktop, I have a Sony RAW file right here. So we're going to open this up into Affinity Photo 2. And as I mentioned, it's going to open up in something called the Develop Persona. It's right here. You can see there's different personas going across the top. The far left is the Photo Persona. That's kind of like Photoshop. Then next to that is Liquify Persona. Of course, there's Liquify in Photoshop as well. We're in the Develop Persona. Next to that is Tone Mapping Persona and then is export persona. So you have all these different kind of modules in uh, Affinity Photo. They just call them personas. Now, editing in Affinity Photo 2 is pretty straightforward, although the controls are a bit different. Now, if you're a longtime user of Lightroom and you remember Lightroom 3, a lot of the edit controls in Affinity Photo 2 are similar to Lightroom 3. Now that's a long time ago. They're up to Lightroom version 14 now. So when you look over at the right hand side, you'll see you have these tabs and we have a basic tab and here we have exposure, enhance, white balance, and so on. And why I say this is similar to Lightroom 3, there's no like highlights, shadows, whites, blacks. You'll notice there's exposure, black point, there's brightness, then you have contrast, clarity, saturation, vibrance. That's much not much difference. Then to get to highlights and shadows, you'd have to roll this open, and you have shadows and highlights here. So there's really no whites or blacks like there is in the current version of Lightroom. So you kind of have to get used to how to edit an image here. You could get just a good, as good of an edit in Affinity Photo 2. You just have to kind of learn how these controls work. Now, across the top, we have other tabs, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Let's start our edit on this image. It's a little bit underexposed, so I'm going to take exposure up. You can see that there's this black point slider. By default, when it's at 0%, it's, you see it's down here about a quarter up. If I move it to left, it's making things brighter, to the right a little darker. Let's move it to the right a little bit. Then we have a brightness slider. Can just move things around, see what they do. We're going to add some contrast. Contrast affects the brightness quite a bit, you'll notice. Uh, clarity, just a straight clarity slider, and it works pretty well. Then we have uh, saturation and vibrance. And saturation, these work just like saturation and vibrance in any other app, in that saturation will affect every single pixel equally. And if you move it too far, it's going to oversaturate colors. And if you move it all the way down, you'll have a black and white image. Vibrance, on the other hand, does not affect the reds and yellows quite as much. So if you have a person in the scene and you don't want to give them a sunburn, you would move the vibrance slider instead. Um, also, it doesn't affect, as I mentioned, all the colors equally. And you can see how it's a little more, I guess, nuanced than the saturation slider. So let's just move that up a little bit. Then we have white balance. I think the white balance is fine on this image. Let's jump down here to... Um, highlights and shadows and open up the shadows. You can see it's not doing quite much here. Oh, we got to turn it on. Sometimes I always forget. You got to click this little checkbox sometimes. Sometimes just opening it up will automatically click the checkbox. And sometimes it doesn't. 
Now, profiles here, let me close that down. We'll turn it back on, though. Um, profiles here uh, isn't like profiles you might be familiar with in Lightroom. These are monitor screen profiles uh, for your display, your display profiles. So probably won't have to mess with those um, really at all. So I have kind of a basic edit, but let's go through the tabs. When we go to the Lens tab, you notice I have Lens Corrections turned on. And if I click on the Lens Profile, nothing's here. What you'll find is if you're using, let's say, a Sony camera with a Sony lens, it will automatically find the lens and apply the lens profile. If you're using Nikon with a Nikon lens, Canon with a Canon lens, and so on. But if you're using, as I did here, I used a Sony camera, an A7R4, with a Sigma lens, a lot of times it won't be able to find the lens. So you'll have to manually find it by going to this dropdown and then scrolling through this humongous list of lenses. And as I mentioned, this was a Sigma uh, 24 to 70 f2.8 uh, art lens. And as I keep scrolling, 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 um, it's uh, 24 f uh, 24 to 70. Uh, uh, it wasn't a macro, so it's this one right here, I believe, uh, art lens. So it's this one. You could favorite it. will be easier for you to find it because then you could go up to this favorite tab and grab it. Uh, so uh, in this case here, I'm just going to click on this to apply it. And you could see that we click there. Now it's applying the lens corrections. Now one thing it doesn't do, um, lens corrections in Lightroom will also de-vignette the image because some lenses, ooh, just about every lens there is, will add a bit of a vignette. You have to do that uh, yourself by going down here and clicking on Remove Lens Vignette. And you could see how it's taking the darker edges away. And you could change that with the intensity slider. Uh, you also could defringe and remove chromatic aberration. I don't think there's a problem here. Um, as I look at it, I think I put clarity up a little bit too high. So I'm going to come here, pull clarity down a little bit. Okay, now we did lens. Let's go to details. Um, here we have noise reduction, and we have luminance noise reduction, and we have color noise reduction. I believe this was shot at ISO 100, so there really isn't any noise to speak of. You also, if you want to add noise, you could do that with noise addition, and you could sharpen the image here with details refinement, so you could add sharpening uh, to your image. You could see you could over sharpen it. But Overall, I found the sharpening in Affinity Photo to be really good. It doesn't tend to over-sharpen an image. It does a really nice job of giving more realistic um, sharpness uh, to the scene. Now, next we have tones. Uh, we have curves, so it's just a regular tone curve. Below that, we have black and white. If you want to convert your image to black and white, you would do it here. Click the checkbox, and then you'll have the slider, so you could say move blues down, and anything that was blue in the color image will get darker. If you have this clicked off, here, let me click it off to there. Obviously, these won't do anything. These only affect the black and white image. Uh, so that's that. And you can double click on a slider to reset it. And we have split toning. If you're familiar with older versions of Lightroom, there was something called split toning. It's just where you could uh, tone a color into the highlights or the shadows. And that's why they call it split toning. So you could put one color in the highlights and a different color in the shadows. And next to that is overlays. Uh, this is a brush in a, a linear gradient. That's They call it overlays here. And you could grab them over here on the left-hand panel, or you could go over here and grab them here. And you could see if you hover over each of these little tools, you can see that's a brush overlay. And this is a gradient overlay. Let's put a gradient overlay on. So we'll click on that. Now you can see you added a gradient overlay. And we'll just click and draw down. You can see we have this red overlay showing us what it's going to affect. And then let's go over to the basic tab and we'll go and say, let's um, move high exposure. And just let me show you. See how it's only affecting the gradient. It's not affecting anything else. So in this case here, let's brighten it up a little bit. Let's add some contrast. And if you want to go back to the original adjustments you did, go to overlays and click on master. And now we're back to our master adjustments that I just did. I opened up shadows, remember, and things like that. So that is overlays. And let's say um, you're kind of happy with this edit. Well, what else we got over here? 
we look over at the left hand side, you have a hand tool and this, you could just drag things around with that. You have the zoom tool so you could click and zoom in and hit uh, command zero on a Mac control zero on a PC to fit it to screen. You also could hit uh, command or control plus to zoom in or command and control minus to zoom out. Um, below that, uh, this is the white balance tool. We have white balance over here, uh, right here as well. And then here we have um, a red eye removal tool. Then we have a blemish tool. The blemish tool works kind of odd in my opinion, but we'll turn that on. You can see right here, maybe there's a little bit of like a bird way off in the distance. First of all, I'm going to get a brush that would work. Uh, use the bracket keys to resize the brush. The right bracket key will make it larger, left bracket key smaller. So what you do is get a brush that's going to fit and then click and draw out to where you want to grab the sample from. So just like that. And that's all, that's how it works. So you can't paint with this. So you would just get a brush that's big enough and then click and drag to the area you want it to grab pixels from to uh, replace where you clicked. And that's how that works. Uh, below that, we have the overlay paint tool. Remember when we were overlays over here, we had a brush and we had a, a linear gradient. Well, this is the brush. They call it a paint tool. And below that, we have an overlay erase tool. Sometimes if you're applying a brush stroke and you make a mistake, you need to erase it. You would use that there. And there's the overlay gradient tool, which I applied to this image. And we, of course, have a crop tool here. Now, all right, I'm happy with this edit, let's say. What do I want to do? Well, it is, just let me stress at the, you know, right here that Affinity Photo is non-destructive. It has not touched that original Sony RAW file and it will not touch that original Sony RAW file. So you have options though of how you could save these edits and that's in this output section. You'll notice there's three options, pixel layer, raw layer embedded, and raw layer linked. If you choose pixel layer, what will happen is it will create a, another file, and it's kind of like a Photoshop PSD file. That file will contain all of your edits, and it's a standalone file. You don't need the original RAW file around anymore. You can just open that file up into Affinity Photo, and it will um, have your, you know, it'd be an edited image. The one thing, though, is you won't be able to re edit anything. Because all of the edits I just did here, I move, you know, clarity and I move saturation and I move these sliders, all those edits get baked in. So when it opens up that file again in Affinity Photo 2, everything is zeroed out and you're like starting from scratch, but you're looking at the edited image. So I hope that made sense. Now, if you want to come back in and re-edit things, let's say I save this and I realize that I, I applied too much clarity. Well, if I use the pixel layer, I won't be able to come back in and re-edit it. But if I choose one of the other two options, I will be. Raw layer embedded, what it will do is it will take your original raw file and it will like make a copy of it and it will embed all your edits in that file and it will give it a new name and affinity photo file. And it still didn't touch the original raw file, just made a copy of it. So then... I'll be able to go back in and do any re-editing I want. The thing, though, that file will be quite large. If you want a smaller file, you use raw layer linked. And what it does is creates a side file that just contains all your edits. But it needs to be in the same folder as the original raw file. So then when you open that original raw file back up into Affinity Photo 2, it will recognize the edits from the sidecar file and show them here, and you'll be able to re-edit it. So let's just say that I'm going to do raw file embedded. And then you just don't go up here like there's no save, you'll notice. And if I try to close, it's going to tell me, hey, you got an operation going on here. You can't close this till you actually save this. Well, what do you do? Well, go over here and click on develop. And when you do that, it will open the image up into the photo persona which is kind of photoshop you're in the you're in photoshop now now you could do some work here if you want um in my next video i'm going to talk about some of the tools in the photo persona and how you would work with the photo persona but right now let's just say i'm happy with this edit what do i do well i would come up here and i get file 
And if I want to export this as, let's say, a JPEG to share it online or to print it or something like that, I would go down here to export. And then here you get the export dialog and you could export the image. Now, I'm not going to do that. I just want to save this. And what I'll do then is I will go up to File and I'll go down to Save or Save As. It doesn't matter at this point. And you'll notice it will be saved as a .af photo and we could save it on the desktop with the original Sony RAW file. So we'll just do that, and we'll click Save. Now once it saves, you can see it's going to take a second to save, then I'll be able to come back up in here and close this down, and then even close Affinity Photo down. And then on my desktop, now I have these two files. I have the original Sony RAW file, and I have the Affinity Photo file. And if we look at the sizes, you'll notice that the Sony RAW file is 123 megabytes, but the Affinity Photo file is 531.6 megabytes. So it is um, way bigger, you know. Um, so it's like 3.7 times bigger, doing math in my head, which is probably wrong. So it's, it's way bigger. And that's because it has the original RAW file embedded in it along with all the edits done to it. Again, you could do it as a linked file instead when we're in the develop persona. And if you do it as linked, it's a lot smaller, but you need the original RAW file in the same folder as it to come back in and re-edit any of your edits. So that's it. That's um, kind of the Adobe Camera Raw version in Affinity Photo, it's called the Develop Persona, and that's just like, you know, to get you started and get you an idea how to use it. And in my next Affinity Photo video, we'll talk more about the Photo Persona, which is really Photoshop, and I'll show you what you could do there.